here. So let's, as we get everyone out of the waiting room and here into the session, if you wouldn't mind chatting in where you are tuning in from. It's always interesting to see where people are tuning in from. You'll see down the lower right-hand part of your screen, if you're on a desktop computer, you'll be able to chat in, type in. We do ask you to keep those somewhat relevant to what we're talking about, so don't talk about what you had for breakfast this morning or whatever. But as we're getting everyone out of the waiting room and here into the session, go ahead and type in where you're tuning in from. Give you a shout out, Maryland, New York City, Las Vegas, South Carolina, Florida, Calgary, Massachusetts, Florida, Indianapolis. Awesome. We get people coming in from all over the country and uh, often we get them, uh, as you can see already, we've got some Canadians here. We've got uh, some folks from outside the country. Always happy to have you here. Our purpose today, we're going to be talking a lot about the performance feedback report and analyzing your performance on the NPTE. Now, chances are those of you who are attending today likely have had a failed attempt, or maybe you're just trying to prepare to prevent a failed attempt. And so we're going to give you some tips and tricks, and I've got some, some performance feedback reports that I'd like to go over. Altogether, I've made them anonymous, so the, no identifiers are on there, but they do provide some good feedback for us as we prepare for the next exam in October. So very, very excited to have everyone here. Again, today our session is going to be mostly about the performance feedback reports. I will be having some another free session or a couple of free sessions coming up geared more towards the structure of the NPT, uh, more about study strategy. We'll, we will talk about some of those today, but in a more, we, we will lightly brush over them, whereas uh, those other ones on those other sessions, I'll dive a little bit deeper into that. So as we get going, let's do a quick sound and video check. You guys hear and see me okay? On your end, hear and see me. So quick sound, video check, check, check. Awesome. So let's talk about the exam itself just really, really briefly. So on the exam, there are 250 questions. So we're talking about the NPTE at this point. So those of you who are tuning in for the PTA exam, recognize that there are some, some subtle differences between the two. But on the NPTE for the PTs, there are 250 questions. Of the 250 questions, 200 of them are scored items, where 50 of them are what they call pretest items. Now, hopefully this isn't news to you, but the 200 items that you, and those of you who are watching this later on YouTube or wherever, just again to very briefly talk about, 200 of the items on the exam are actually scored, and that's what your score is based on. The other 50 they use as pretest items, and what that means is they're just rolling them out in a test environment to see how they bear up against the statistics of the other questions. So for instance, if a question is under pretest conditions and everyone bombs it, then they send it back to the writers and they have them redo it. The bottom line though is that you cannot distinguish any of those 50 from the other 200. They all look the same. There's no distinguishing characteristics about them. You just have to answer them as if it was the real deal. And then they space those out evenly among the five sections on the PT exam. So you can expect about 10 of those pretest items per section. I've had some people believe the myth that, that maybe they, they cram all 50 of those pretest items into the fourth section or the fifth section. That's not true. They, they space them out evenly, randomly among all of the, the other 200 questions, just so you know. And the PTA is just different numbers. 150 of them are scored in 50 or pretest items. So on the test itself, just to talk very briefly about the scoring model, they use a scale scoring model, which means that you have to achieve a 600 out of 800 scale score in order to pass the exam. Now what the 600 out of 800, usually it comes out to close to 75%, but not necessarily 75%. So remember, it's, it's a big about, more or less. And I'll, I'll show you on the score reports a little bit later what the more or less what the passing score was on the exam. The reason they do this is because on any given test day, there are somewhere between five and 10 versions of the exam that are dispersed throughout the country randomly. They do that so that if you are sitting next to your classmate taking the same test, you'll be taking an entirely different set of questions. So you can't, obviously it's, it's a mechanism to try to prevent cheating as much as possible. But because there are 10 different versions of the exam, just by nature of the exam itself, it, the, some, of the, some exam forms will be slightly easier and some will be slightly harder. And so they try to use this scale score to make it equivalent across all the different exam forms. 
So that's why the goofy 600 out of 800 scale score model. Just recognize that you have to achieve over 600, and I'll talk on these score reports about exactly where that is. More Well, it, not exactly, but more or less. Now, there are some of you here today who have had your score withheld. Uh, just a note, if you had, so we just had the test last week, so five business days ago, we're on the sixth business day. At five business days out, they have to release the score to the state. However, they, if there is a question about the performance of the individual, they will withhold that score while they perform, or they have you fill out some surveys in order to determine what was what was going on with your score. Now, let me talk about some of the reasons why your score might have been withheld. So the one that I see the most often is this, a large score increase from a previous attempt. Now, that's, it's not necessarily that, but a lot of times what, what their computer is spitting back at them is that, so let's say you performed 520, 530 on your first attempt, but after you've done some remediation, you took my course or something, you had a 100 point increase, and now you're in the 620s or 630s. What that does, the computer kicks back to the FSBPT and tells them that it was an unusual pattern or, or an unusual gain from one attempt to the next attempt. And so what they do is they, they send out a survey to you. And I'll talk, I've got that here on the next slide. They send you out a survey and they just ask you to explain what you did in order to get such a score increase or a change in score. Or really, they're just asking you what you did for your preparation on this latest attempt. Biggest thing there is just answer that, that survey as completely and honestly as possible. And then the dreaded, you've got, just got to continue waiting at that point, which is terrible. So you have to wait another couple of days until they sort out, they have to manually review uh, your survey submission, make sure everything is kosher, and then they send, it, send out your score at that point. Uh, the other reasons you could get a score withheld is if you had some sort of unusual pattern of answers. Uh, I mean, you could say, I think they said that if, um, and I've been to the FSBPT training on this on two separate occasions over the last couple of years. So what they do is, what they say is that if someone has the exact same answers as someone else in the same facility or in the same area, it makes them wonder if there was some sort of collaboration between the two or if there was some, if they had access to the questions ahead of time. Again, they just want to know what your, what your uh, progress or your, uh, your study plan was so that they can make sure it wasn't due to cheating, it was actually due to effort on your part. And then the other one that is also very common is that if you, just in the stress of the situation, you get the easy questions incorrect and the hard questions correct. That also spits out to the computer and says, you know, let's just check, make sure this person hasn't, you know, hasn't had access to test questions ahead of time. And so they got the easy ones wrong, but the hard ones right. Anyway, that, those are some of the reasons why your score might be withheld. For you, the, the real, uh, real bottom line here is just answer that survey they send out completely honestly, send it back to them, and then just keep waiting, which is no fun. So on the test itself, the FSBPT publishes a content outline describing what is on each test. Now they do it in just broad, very broad strokes, very broad guidelines. You can see in this, it's very small print. Sorry for those of you guys that are on a mobile device, you might have to zoom in here, but it breaks it down by body systems. We've got cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and neuromuscular. Those are our big three. And then we've got the other systems as well, lymphatic system, system interactions. Then it goes across by PT category. So examination, differential diagnosis, prognosis, and evalu evaluation. And interventions and then we also have the non-system section which comes down here so you see all these non-systems so it talks it breaks it down by the number of questions in each of these categories i guess what i would point out to you here is that the big three these guys represent the bulk of the questions on the exam almost 75 percent of the test questions come from cardiovascular musculoskeletal neuromuscular and just a bit of the integumentary. I mean, those guys are probably the most, most heavily represented on the test. The non-systems domain, we have somewhere between 25 and 30 questions. So it is a you know, relatively big section, but it's not certainly not as big as the other three sections. I guess I just wanted to point that out here, that the non-systems, which a lot of people struggle with the non-systems, you'll notice that there are not very many questions in each section of the non-systems. So equip, equipment, devices, modalities, 
safety protection, professional responsibilities, and research. Each of those have about five questions each. We've got about five categories, comes to about 25 questions in that, in that section. All right, so there are some of you who have already purchased your performance feedback report. And in fact, some of you sent those to me and we'll be talking about those today in the session. If you want to purchase your performance feedback report after this discussion, this is the link to it. You just Google FSBPT performance feedback report. It costs you 90 bucks plus a transaction fee. So they're not shy about, about charging you for this thing. And hopefully based on, they will give you a free a free score report. It's different than the performance feedback report. The score report is is much more brief in nature, whereas this performance feedback report is is less brief. And I'll give you my recommendations about whether or not you should or should consider buying your performance feedback report. But for those of you who have, we're going to be talking about these and hopefully it's useful to you. Okay. All right, so here is our first performance feedback report. Well, before we get going on this, any other questions or concerns thus far? And go ahead and type those into the chat box if you have any other questions or concerns or any that come up along the way. I want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, yeah, so just feel free to type in any questions you may have. All right, so this first performance feedback report, the person got a 559 on the test. So 559 comes out, they got, uh, let's see, 123 correct items, which is somewhere around 62% of the total items of the total 200. And so again, the small print, sorry about that, guys. But I'll try to read this out to you as we go through it. So this person got 123 correct. The percent correct was about 62%. So they're a little bit low on their percentages. They have this uh, on track to pass score. What that means is that if you were to sit down and take any of their other any of their other test forms that same day with the same preparation under the same uh, test conditions, they they predict statistically what your performance range would have been on any of those other conditions if you were just to sit down and take the test again. And so as you can see, that I mean they don't do that for the broad total of the score, but all these other ones. Uh, show that their percentages, basically, they give you an estimate of what you would perform if you were to take the test again. And so this person, they performed a 61% on the physical therapy examination section. But if they were to take the test that same day, there's a possibility they could reach up to 71% on that particular section. Honestly, I don't find the on track to pass terribly useful just because, I mean, it's kind of a moot point. They, they point out that, yes, if you'd sat and taken another form, it might have been a little bit different. But it doesn't really help you in your plan for the next time around. Unless, I mean, let's say you're at like a 599 or something. You're right there at the, at the border. Then there's a, I don't know, the on track to pass, I don't find particularly useful. I mean, yes, statistically, it shows you what you could have performed. But again, you're not going to be performing that same day. You have three months now before you can take it again. And there are a couple of things that hopefully will happen and hopefully will not happen in the next three months. One of which you don't want to forget any of the good stuff you know. And the second thing is that hopefully you prepare more for the next attempt. So rather I find these box and whisker plots to be a bit more useful. So this shows where the score is. This was the person's score in relation to the 600 out of 800 scale score, that, that passing score. And so you can see fairly visually that this person struggled most with physical therapy examination and physical therapy interventions. Those two sections were the worst. Now the examination section obviously was closer. This, bo this box and whisker plot, helped, it points to them that statistically there was a possibility that they could have passed it. And they're not that far away from passing. But the intervention section was significantly below. The whole thing was significantly below the 600 out of 800 mark. Again, visually showing that there, you require some significant remediation in the interventions section. And I'll talk, well, maybe now is a good time to talk about how to improve the intervention section. Because this is so commonly a problem on, on score reports. I see it very frequently. The intervention section is a difficult section because you have to not only consider 
what the condition is, but you also have to consider what the next step is. They love to ask questions about the next step or what is the next safest, most effective way to do this, that, or the other. They love to ask about manual interventions. You know, what direction would your force be placed? What would your hand placement be like? There's just so many innumerable permutations of interventions that it makes it kind of a sticky a sticky one to study because even if you open up Kisner's therapeutic exercise, I mean, you'll find just some broad, I mean, there are some specifics in there. There's some specific suggestions for exercise, but you'll also find that there are a lot of broad ideas about, you know, what to mobilize, when to mobilize it, what kind of exercises to add for quadriceps or gastrocnemius or biceps. Um, all those come in such a wide variety of dosages and so frequency, uh, the intensity, the time, and the type of exercise, the FITT principle, you'll find that there's a lot there. So what I've found over the years, I've been doing this for over six years now, that people who struggle with interventions almost always need a little bit help of help with their examination as well. In fact, you can see that correlated very nicely on this score report. So how to improve interventions, I believe, comes from first improving examination. Now, what do I mean by examination? Examination is just the data you collect about the condition. So for instance, let's talk about um, Achilles tendon rupture, Achilles tendon rupture and reconstruction. The more you understand about that condition and why their quadricep tends to get weak very quickly and what the purpose of quadricep strengthening is, um, and why you would strengthen some of the other joints around it, strengthen the ankle and strengthen the hip, strengthen the, the uninvolved leg. The more you understand about the condition, the easier it is to decide what intervention you would do. Uh, the same thing goes for maybe more complicated conditions, say like uh, multiple sclerosis. Someone with multiple sclerosis, understanding the multiple sclera in the nervous system, but that they have a, a heat intolerance which means that they have a very difficult time exercising if it is very warm. They also tend to do much better in the morning. So you can see how the more you understand about the condition, the easier it is to determine what the best intervention for that person would be. So again, my big recommendation for interventions is to improve the examination section. And the best way to improve that examination section is just to learn the definitions and the diagnosis of those conditions, just learn them down pat. You know, how do you distinguish the difference between a calf tear, so an Achilles uh, tendon rupture or gastrocnemius tear, and a deep vein thrombosis? Because as you, soon as you can understand the difference between those two, then you'll understand a little bit better about how the interventions would differ between those two. So evaluation, differential diagnosis, and prognosis was really pretty solid here. I mean, they're right on the borderline. So uh, obviously bumping that up just a little bit. Again, as you imp increase that examination or the definition of these conditions, that differential diagnosis becomes a, a bit more straightforward. Now, the non-systems did fantastic on the non-systems, which again is a bit unusual. A lot of times the non-systems can be a, a challenge for a lot of people. But again, there's not that many questions. So you can see a big swing, you know, a few questions right or wrong can make a big dramatic swing in that non-systems. Now, also something a little unusual about this score report was that the cardiovascular system did fantastic. I mean, really, really well in that cardiovascular system, which is awesome. So my advice as you attempt, you go for your next attempt with this one is to just make sure don't, don't forget any of that good cardiovascular stuff that you, and pulmonary system that you've learned very well. These other systems, though, they definitely need a little bit of help. So musculo, uh, neuromuscular, integumentary lymphatics, and even the other systems. So all of these guys, they need a bit more help, especially on that examination section. So what I would do is I would suggest that you go to the musculoskeletal section, bust out David McGee or um, Dutton, and really just start working on the definition of those musculoskeletal conditions, um, especially the ankle, foot, knee, hip, back, neck, all of those guys, I mean, you just got to go through all those musculoskeletal conditions. Same with neuromuscular nervous system. And then the other systems, there's not that many questions in the other systems. A total of 27 in the other systems. And so again, 
a few more questions correct in the other systems will make a big swing up in that particular score. And then finally on the report, they give you, they break it down by section. Again, this is an interesting pattern. You can see that sections one, three, and five were all significantly worse than sections two and four. Now my theory here, and again, there are a lot of factors that go into your performance by section. Number one was the worst. A lot of times that test anxiety really kicks in in section one. You just get into the test, your eyes go blurry, palms start sweating, and suddenly you can't remember a thing that you studied. But then once you get to section two, things start to really warm up and you're starting to feel, your, feel the ice melt a little bit and, and really get your brain to work again. Sometimes that break, there's a break between after section two, a 15 minute break where you can take a break, go to the bathroom, get a drink of water, whatever. But that whole process, you have to fingerprint out, fingerprint in, get your picture ID. I mean, everything, it's just kind of a painful process. And I, I still recommend taking it, but just prepare yourself mentally for that process, that it's kind of a pain to get out, it's kind of a pain to get back in. Just get ready for that. Because I can see that a section three also did poorly. Um, there's an argument that that could be because they got out of the groove and now they have to dive back in and try to refocus again. Because section four, section four is just like section two, finally warmed up and doing good. Section five, again, a very common problem spot because they run out of time. That's my guess here is that the time was starting to get a little bit, uh, a little crunchy. It's starting to get to crunch time where there just wasn't that much time to go back and review. They're starting to feel a little bit more of the stress and they start to fall apart just a little bit. So my suggestions for this person are to plan on taking some mini mental breaks, especially in section one and section three. It's not the mini mental status exam. Rather, this is a mini mental break. And what I mean by that is just to, to take two good deep breaths, maybe close your eyes, just kind of imagine yourself on a beach somewhere, just really, really take a moment to relax. And I, I am saying just a moment. You don't have 15 minutes to just sit there and relax. Rather, just take a moment, relax, and dive into the next question. And you may have to take a couple of those to try to calm the nerves and focus on the question that's ahead of you. There's also some good advice, uh, especially for eye strain. You know, when you're staring at that computer screen for five hours straight and you're not particularly used to staring at the computer screen, again, I suggest that you, you know, either close your eyes or look up at the ceiling or do something where you're focused away from the screen for about 20 seconds. Try to just give yourself a little mini mental break. I would suggest that especially in number sections one and three. Number five, you could do it too. We tend to start falling apart in time management by section five. So again, take it for what it's worth. Just try to calm down and focus in a little bit better. And then time management for sure. Like you should be averaging about one hour per section. Or 72 seconds per item. It's hard to keep track of the per item but it's a, it's a lot easier to keep track of that per section. So again, just try to pace yourself per section. Uh, just get used to the idea of what 72 seconds per item feels like on average, and you should be good to go. There you go. There's your performance feedback report number one. I've got five of these, well, six of these guys. So we're going to, these other ones, well, they'll have a lot of similar characteristics. I'll probably go through these just a little bit faster. Uh, the performance feedback report here, they scored a 583. So again, a little bit closer to to the passing mark, and you can see that bearing out in each of the professional work activities as they go through. I mean, really, all the way through examination, differential diagnosis, and interventions, all, all of those are really very close to the mark. The non-systems might have been the one that pushed them over the edge here. Where they were so close otherwise, this might have been the X factor for them. Now, that being said, it is possible if you aced all of these guys, but let me go over here. If we aced all of these sections, cardiovascular, muscular, neuro, and integumentary, it is possible to miss every single one of those non-systems and still pass the test because you don't have to pass every section or pass every category in order to pass the test. They're just looking at the cumulative score. So where's the most bang for this person's buck? It's probably in bumping up the PT examination, differential diagnosis, and interventions with some focus on non-systems. Again, remember, 
non-systems. There's only, like on this particular exam form, there were 28. And so if you just got another, like they got 50%, if they got five more questions correct, then it, you know, that would put them over the top. And five more questions in the non-systems, it's not unachievable. But at the same time, you could also have gotten five more questions in the musculoskeletal system. Let's say that's your area of expertise and you love the musculoskeletal system. Be sure to put some time in on that musculoskeletal system so that you can go way over the top this next attempt. You can compensate for, you know, if you're a little bit low in one section, you can compensate by having a little bit higher in the other section. That's what I'm trying to say. Let's see. So this person, this is a good time to point out the passing score on the exam. So again, remember, scale score has to be at 600 out of 800. This person, they scored 130 items correct and got a 583. That puts the passing score somewhere in the 135 to 137 range. And I know that's for a lot of you, you're going to say to yourself, now, Will, you just told me 75% is kind of the target. But 135 out of 200 is not 75%. 150 out of 75 out of, sorry, 150 out of 200 is 75%. So really, that should be good news for you, that the target is around 135 to 137 for this, the passing score, at least on this exam form. I would still encourage you to target that 75% or target 100%, really. Try to target as high as you can. But do your best to get up and above that you know, 135, 137 mark. That's kind of the very bare minimum for passing. So this person is about five questions away from passing. Kind of frustrating to see that. At the same time, it should be encouraging in the sense that there's you don't have to overcome a whole lot to get over that passing mark. It's it's kind of that carrot on the end of the stick. It's so close, yet so far away. But uh, just bumping everything up by about five questions, I mean, you'll just be able to crush this one out. You can see the musculoskeletal system was maybe a little bit weaker than the other ones. Not dramatic, but definitely weaker. And the musculoskeletal system is highly represented on the exam. So you can see how... If this person bumps the musculoskeletal system, they'll be you know, easily over the top, especially if they, hit, if they hit the non-systems too. And there's plenty of time to hit both. We've got three months before the next exam. Should be able to hit that musculoskeletal system and the, neuro, or, and the non-systems and just really crush it out this next time. You can also see an interesting thing. There, there's a lot of what-ifs in, in this person's score report. So section five should just jump out off the screen at you and say, okay, you're doing really pretty well in these other sections, but what happened in section five? And it's back to that time management. It's very likely this person was strapped for time, getting down to the wire and finding they, they were stressed and having a harder time focusing on the question at hand or rushing through the questions. So section five just really, this, this might've been the one. I mean, because you can see that all these other sections, they were getting 26, 28, 27, where this one was 23. So they're about four questions short on that final section, which was about what they needed to pass. So really, there's, there's an argument that by bumping up that fifth section, they could have been over the passing mark. It's frustrating, and I know retrospect is hard to, hard to swallow sometimes. We always have 2020 vision looking back. But again, time management is going to be crucial. The next time around, make sure we're targeting one hour per section or 72 seconds per item especially giving yourself enough time in that final section so you can go through it at a decent pace. All right, our next score report, this puts us at a 526. This is performance feedback report number three that I've got. This person scored a 526, and you can see just right off the bat that very much below the passing mark on practically every work, work activity, examination, evaluation, differential diagnosis, and prognosis. What I thought was interesting about this score report is that the integumentary and lymphatic system was so much higher than the other systems. Again, that's not terribly surprising. I mean, there's, there's only 17 questions on the integumentary and lymphatic system. So, you know, they got 16 out of 17 right, which means they really rocked that, that uh, integumentary system. But it wasn't enough to compensate for the lack in any of the other systems, the bigger sections. So again, this person, I would suggest starting at the very beginning with the examination techniques, you know, data collection and understanding more about that, the conditions, especially as they relate to the big three, cardiovascular, musculoneuromus, and neuromuscular nervous systems. 
Now, a lot of times the big question I get at this point is, Will, with a 526, can I get to the 600 mark? You know, how hard is it to get up to the 600 mark? Well, I've had a lot of people take my class and get over 100 point score gains. I mean, it's very possible. And I think my record holders scored about 150 points more from one attempt to the next attempt. So yes, absolutely possible. But down to 526, it means that you're going to really need to focus and get a lot of work done between now and the next exam date, especially in those big three sections. And so I'd really suggest getting to work, you know, really as soon as you're, you're mentally able to just dive in and focus again on the exam and studying a solid two to four hours on a very regular basis, especially in those big three, cardiovascular, musculoskeletal, and neuromuscular. And that's something I really help people do during our course. We go over all those sections. I've got a workbook that helps go through all those different sections. And you have access to the instructors so you can reach out and get questions answered as you need them. So this person, you can see this was an interesting kind of an inverse relationship to Section 5 just compared to that last one I showed you. The Section 5 was actually their best score, which is very curious to me. You know, why, why was Section 5 better than the other ones? Um, I don't have a really good answer here. It's hard to, hard to say what was going on during test time. It might be that they finally, finally got into the rhythm and finally started answering questions you know, the way they knew they would, were or knew they should be. There's a possibility that they rushed through these other sections and then had extra time on the fifth section. That's a total possibility. Um, yeah, there's, I, again, no great rhyme or reason on why why section five was particularly better than the other sections, but you can see sections one through four really need some help. And so pacing, focus, those are the things you'll need for sections one through four. So Patricia, great question. How do you improve differential diagnosis? Again, I think it really comes back to the examination in the sense that as you understand the illnesses and conditions a bit better. So for instance, hypo versus hyperthyroidism. I mean, one has too much thyroid, one has too little thyroid. How do you decide between those two? It's really based on the symptoms that present. And so just making a little table about hypo versus hyperthyroidism. And you'll find that that is your differential diagnosis, just understanding the distinction between similar conditions. Another great example would be between uh, subacromial bursitis and rotator cuff tendonitis. You know, how do you distinguish between those two? They're both the shoulder, they both hurt. Um, how do you distinguish between those two? Well, if you understand the definition of the symptoms of your exam of a rotator cuff, then you'll find that there are differences between that and the subacromial, or the subacromial bursitis. Let's see, uh, Lori, how long is the course? We go for about eight weeks. We're starting on August 18th. I'll talk about that here in just a sec in a little more detail. Uh, this person, let's see, what else did I want to say? Uh, Patricia, I noticed when I improve in one section, I tend to do less in the other section. And that comes back to the maybe the biggest piece of advice that is so hard to implement is just to not forget anything. You're because you start focusing on something else, it's easy to start forgetting that thing. And so again, I'll, I'll tell you, there is, and I'll talk more about this, maybe those of you who attend another session of mine, you'll find that I talk about it. There was a Harvard study not too long ago that talked about, you know, what are the best things to improve performance on standardized tests? Now, number one on the list was perform practice exams, that when you practice, in a test environment, there's nothing that can substitute for having good practice on a practice exam. The next thing they did is they called some, it's really something that in PT we do all the time. It's called distributed random practice or distributed practice. Basically, what they suggest, and I, I'm totally on board with them, is that, you know, let's say you have week one, Week two, and maybe you guys have heard me say this before, but also I'll just be brief. Week three, that during the week, let's say that you have a target item you want to study on Monday or something. Let's say your target item, you're going to talk about, about uh, musculoskeletal system. Musculoskeletal system examination is specifically about the knee. You study on that. 
you don't study on that again. Well, sorry, you, it's not don't study on that. You study that a little bit the next day. Just review the notes that from the previous day. Then wait and wait or skip a day. This looks like an EKG drawing. Sorry about that, guys. And then you review it again on say Thursday, and maybe again on Friday. Come back. And then you go through this next week and you review it maybe just twice that week on Wednesday and Friday. And I'm talking about reviewing what you reviewed in this target time here. You're just doing a 15 minute review here, 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 here. And I'm being very non specific here because I just want to talk about the idea. So then let's say that on Tuesday you choose another topic. Let's say you want to talk, you know, maybe you're still in the musculoskeletal system. You're going to do the hip today. Really master the hip, so you're going to really crush out that hip. And what you do is you start creating the same sort of a schedule for the hip. And then on some of these days, you can, again, you're going to spend about 15 minutes reviewing these guys and do the same thing and start creating a schedule like this that becomes where you've studied the hip this day, but you've also spent about 15 minutes studying what you studied the day before. So that's the idea. And then you continue this with topic after topic. You add your next topic here, and make sure that you're adding that topic here, here, and here, sort of a thing. And you can see how that would continue on until the next week with greater and greater intervals between the times that you study that particular topic. And again, these are smaller study sessions that are reviewing what you looked at during the bigger study session. So that's one way to keep things fresh, uh, doing that distributed practice. Let's see, Prima, what is the average of points one person can improve from one test to the next? Prima, that is a great question. Uh, it depends totally. I have, I've talked to people who have had 150-point score gains. I've also had people who've had a 20-point score decrease. I mean, it's, it really depends a lot on the effort and energy you put into your next preparation. If you do more of the same thing, chances are you'll get more of the same result. So my suggestion is to try to at least switch it up or improve something some way. But average, you know, if a person just sat down to take, the, you know, three months without forgetting anything, they might see a five to ten point increase. But again, it's it, totally dependent. I've, I've seen people's scores go down because they forget stuff. Let's see. Da, da, da. Jason, awesome. Congratulations. Let's see, the, the, the retention problem. I think we talked about that. Okay, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. How to divide the study. That's my difficulty. I took your course and all the homework and still didn't pass. So Patricia, great question. How to divide the study. A lot of times it just comes to uh, making, making a plan and sticking to it. I mean, it's nothing more than that. It's everyone has available time and then making their time really work for them. So for instance, if you've got, if you can squeeze two hours a day very consistently, kind of in the pattern I showed you, then you can get through a lot of content in not that long a time. So three months between now and the next exam, exam, you'll be able to go through a lot of content and try to retain as much as possible. Let's see, Cheryl, great question. I'm torn between taking it again in October or January. I need some advice, I'm kind of lost. All right, so Cheryl, I'll tell you the distinction or why to, when to make the decision of waiting three months or waiting six months. And so I'm going to try to write that down here. Let's see. Take the exam sooner or take, let's see, let's go down a little bit. Take the exam later. So those are kind of the two, two questions you're asking there. You know, what would make the decision between taking it sooner or taking it later? I usually encourage people to take the exam sooner than later, and I've got a couple of reasons for that. And you, you need to make your decision based on your case, but I'll tell you my reasons. Number one is it's just too easy. Here, I'm going to, let me do it in text form so you guys can actually read my handwriting. So number one, it's easy to forget stuff. I think that's a fairly straightforward point that, you know, the more time that elapses, you have something that's called attrition where things just tend to disappear, they fall out of your head, they just tend to be forgotten. So number one, it's easy to forget stuff. Number two, human nature 
pushes us is to procrastinate. How many times have you had that? So let's say that you, you said you were going to take the exam in January instead of October, so later rather than sooner, yet you didn't actually start studying until November. So really, you gave yourself six months to forget stuff and only studied for about eight weeks. The only time I suggest people really wait the six months is if they have the, the dedication and perseverance to really take advantage of the time because otherwise they're just procrastinating the inevitable and forgetting stuff. And so that's, you know, unfortunately, that's just kind of the way things go when it comes to, comes to procrastination. So I would suggest that taking it sooner than later is better because it's so easy to forget stuff and we usually procrastinate anyway. So taking the exam later, you would do this if you, let's see, let me change my color. If you needed some serious remediation. And what I mean by that is that, let's say you scored below 500 and you were just very, very far away. You needed to relearn a lot, a lot, a lot of content that would be uh, indicative that you probably needed to take it a little bit later. Give yourself a bit more time. The other one would be, it's really related to that serious remediation. If, if you've been out of school a long time, so really if you've forgotten everything, <laughs> if you've forgotten everything, you've been out of school for 5, 10, 15 years, um, you're just going to need more time to relearn all that. So really, serious remediation or you've really forgotten everything, that's when you'd make the decision to take it later. Now, rem remember, you don't always have the choice because FSPPT has a three, time, three times in a row rule where you can only take the exam three, three consecutive attempts before they make you wait, until, wait through one of the attempts and take it the next time. So basically what that means is if you took it in January, April, and July, you would be ineligible to take it in October. Oh, let's see. In October, because they do not allow you to take it four times in a row. You have to take three in a row. Or if you do take three in a row, you take a break and you'd start up again in January. So you may not have the option at that point. Then you just you really gotta just dedicate your six months and get to work. Let's see, Violet, Prima, so glad to hear that from you guys. Good, uh, let's see, Dean, really appreciate that. Uh, da, 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 let's see, so, thank you guys. Just hammer at Patricia, you do your background. And let's see. Patricia, what is PTFE, PT final exam? Right, right. All right, that is the name of the do, do. Make sure I get everyone's questions. Okay, Andres, great question. So that was one of the original questions. Do I or should you purchase the performance feedback report? So remember, the performance feedback report costs you a solid 90 bucks plus transaction fee. Is it going to give you very much information? So if your score was like, let's see, I think I've got in this next person. So this, look at this person. They scored a 594, which means they were very, very close. They scored 133 questions correct. They're probably only three questions away. My guess is that if you asked this person, they could, set, they could have self-identified and say, yes, I know that I have problems with interventions. I've always had problems with interventions. I just know it. I also know that I've got just a little problem and everything, but nothing really glaring. And you look at their, I mean, by section, I mean, they're kind of going down a little bit, maybe test fatigue, but that's, it's not dramatic one way or the other. I mean, they're, you know, 28 questions versus 26 questions. I mean, again, this performance feedback report, unfortunately, doesn't tell us a whole lot. We just know that the person was a little bit off in everything. Maybe interventions was the worst.
Hey guys, back. Sorry, internet gremlins, they just, they happen to the best of us. So anyway, my point with this person is that it is the performance feedback report doesn't tell us a whole lot of really great useful information as compared to some of those others did. So my suggestion is if you're 585 and above, you probably won't benefit very much from the performance feedback report. Don't let me talk you out of it if you're planning on do it, doing it. Going, go ahead and do it. I won't judge you. I would suggest, though, that it's not going to give you a ton of really great information. So that's my suggestion there. 585 and above, it really isn't telling you a whole lot. I mean, even in the whole 580s, 580s, 590s, you're just not very far. 570s and below, it'll start to show you where you may have gone off the rails. And again, it's not absolutely necessary. Most people can self-identify and say, yeah, I really struggled with the cardiovascular questions. I've always struggled with that. That's just my problem. Trouble is cardiovascular. And then they just you know, go and work on cardiovascular and save themselves 90 bucks and just get to work. See, Patricia, I'm with you too. I, on uh, talking about I should pass this person <laughs> or the, the FSBPT should pass, I really wish they didn't give scores in the 590s. It's just so depressing to see that they're only like two or three questions away from passing. Just so distressing because, I mean, honestly, that's like insult to injury. Yeah, you didn't pass and you were like one question off and we don't care. So that's just the way it goes with that. Again, performance feedback report, they're within... This person was within two questions on all the 28, 27, 26, 26, 26. I mean, they were just right there on the mark the whole time. All right, so I've got a fifth one here. So this person got a 559 on, well, let's see, hold that thought. Just looking through the questions here. So yeah, da, da, da. Jot down. Yes, so I got the score. What time is the improvement? Let's see if you can do it past PT world for 17 years. If I can do it, you can do it too. So this is Dean. I've been out of the PT world for 17 years, graduated 2001, joined PTFE in January, uh, passed and enjoying PT world again. Thanks, PTFE. Rock on. You know, wheel crane fist bumps all around. Uh, let's see. Anthony, would you recommend not changing our study habits if we scored in the 590s? I, good question. I mean, because obviously something's working for you. If you're in the 590s, you're only like a couple of questions off. Something's working. So keep doing more of what's working and do less of what's not working. And so that could be just um, really focusing a little bit in more depth on some of those, those content areas, maybe focusing a little bit more time on interventions and examination. Again, do what's, continue to do what's working, absolutely. And then just try to build upon that as much as you can. Let's see, Don, uh, let's see, well, no, let's see, back up just a little bit. Uh, da, da, da. Taking this October, this, um, Patricia, study kinesiology book, is that a good idea? Oh, yeah, yeah, kinesiology, you've, all, you've got, I mean, kinesiology, that's one of those base concepts. You've got to understand the roll glide principle, you've got to understand lever arms, you've got to understand how the biceps works and the Achilles tendon works, all that. See, Don, will, uh, 590, would you suggest taking it again in October? Again, back to what I said, Don, about the suggestion to take it sooner than later. I'm a big, big proponent of taking it sooner rather than later. Just because it's so easy to forget things. Obviously, you're very close. Three months is sufficient time to improve five or ten questions. You should be way over the top by then. All right, so let's see, this person, this person scored a 559 on the test. You can see physical therapy examination and differential diagnosis were the worst. Exam, or the interventions was pretty good and non-systems was pretty good. So again, it comes back to that examination, making sure you understand very clearly the definitions and the signs and symptoms of all of the different conditions. Neuromuscular and integumentary systems needed the most help, but cardiovascular and musculo could certainly use a little bit of help. Again, it's just because they're so highly represented on the exam, you want to make sure that you are spending enough time in those sections. Let's see, and then you look at their 
their buy section. I mean, number one was slightly worse than the others, but they're within a two point spread on every single, you know, 24, 25, 26, 24, 24. Very close there. So it doesn't look like time management is a particularly bad issue or test anxiety. It's really just hammering out that content. And you can see that 559, 559, it's starting to gear more towards understanding the content a little bit better rather than just test taking skills. Now I've seen, I have seen score reports where number one was terrible down here and you know they just bombed section number one but then aced all the other sections. That could be certainly due to test anxiety. They get into the test, they can't concentrate, they can't focus very well. So again, if you do see that on your score report, especially in sections one and two, understand that's probably test anxiety. And the thing with test anxiety is everyone experiences it, but not to the same degree. And so if you're experiencing very significant test anxiety, you may consider applying for accommodations on the test. The FSBBT provides the possibility to get test accommodations, the most common of which is to have increased time or time and a half on the test. And I have found that they are really fairly lenient with that. As long as you have some sort of medical documentation of your anxiety, it's very easy to get that approval. Very, very easy. You have to submit the form and wait and do all that. But they're, they're fairly accommodating when it comes to that. Awesome. Violet, Jason, Karen, Violet, thank you so much for, for your words of affirmation. It really helps. All right, so we do have a couple of PTAs who are here today. And so uh, just to talk very briefly about the PTA exam, this person scored a 597. Again, uh, just there's, they're so close. Looking at their exam scores, I mean, you can see the data collection, which is kind of the equivalent of the examination section on the PT exam, is very close, but they're, they're really very close on all these. I mean, even the, the data collection was not very far off. Uh, bumping up their, their score by really just a couple of questions. I mean, there were only 32 items in there. They scored 16 correct. So bumping up to, say, 20 out of 32, that probably would have put them right there at the passing mark. Uh, this, again, you can see cardiovascular musculo skewed a little bit off. But again, this person could probably self-identify and say, yeah, I just, I knew I was, I've never been good at cardiovascular. I just need to spend more time there. This person, again, their score was really pretty tight grouping, 22, 24, 26, and 20. Uh, maybe a little bit of time running out in section four, but not dramatic. I don't know, nothing terribly dramatic about this one. As you can see, 597 means they were just very, very close to passing that. And again, this is the PTA exam I'm showing here. All right, so in conclusion, Build upon foundational principles. So Patricia, just like we talked about, spending time in the kinesiology, the anatomy, the definition. Like, um, if you don't have this book, you need this. Well, you need these two books, really. So they're both by the same author. Just one has a different focus. If you guys have seen this one, Differential Diagnosis for Physical Therapists, very good. But that Goodman also wrote the big one on pathology. And so as you spend time in these books, you'll be able to define the conditions a bit better, especially in the other systems, the cardiovascular and the neuromuscular system. And then getting into McGee and Dutton for the, the musculoskeletal system is also fantastic. So be sure to study proportionately. That's another big thing. People get really hung up on the non-systems when really the non-systems represent less than 25% of the exam. So be sure to just study proportionately. Make sure you're getting in, regardless of what your score was, make sure you're getting time in on the big three, musculoskeletal, neuromuscular, and cardiopulmonary. Uh, sections one, three, and five are usually the worst just because number one, you get stressed out. Number three, you're coming back from the break and you're having a hard time refocusing. And number five, because you're running out of time. So section one and three especially take those mini mental breaks where you just take, take a little break, take a breather. 15 seconds, 20 seconds of just, just breathing and doing nothing else and then dive back into the test. And so I think we answered this question already. Should I buy the performance feedback report? For me, the cutoff is right around that 580 mark. If you're, 
above 580, I don't think you really need it. I, I don't think it gives you a lot of really useful information. Don't, don't get me wrong. If you want to buy it, buy it. Maybe it'll show something goofy. Um, but for the most part, I find that people that are above 580 usually don't get a lot of really helpful information. They just get more more depressing information that they, they were so close and they were still close in their worst section they were still close whereas those below 580 usually you can find something that really needs some specific work let's see and so just to talk briefly about the live course i know some of you here are considering taking my live course we're starting up on august 18th we're targeting the october exam uh, we'll go for about eight weeks we are the highest rated npt prep course on the internet. You'll find that we are far and away above everyone else when it comes to that. I think we're up to 368 five-star reviews. Uh, you, you'll find that we have a, a high focus on customer service, helping people feel like they're a part of, of a real support group. Plus, we go over a ton of content. Plus, just like the most loving coach would do, we make you work like crazy because we've got to get that content into your head for test day. It cost, does cost $4.99 for the three-month access. So, for instance, if you signed up right now, you'd be able to start going through a lot of the content early before our begin date on August 18th. Part of this August 18th date business is just so we can... It, it really relates to the jurisdiction approval deadlines. We try to work around those deadlines. And the, anyway, it's just kind of some, some uh, mechanics on this end is why we're starting, starting at that point. But if you sign up right now, can have access to all of our independent study course modules, get the workbook, study guide, get everything, and just get a you know get a real jump start on things. We have a bunch, a bunch, a bunch of pre-recorded stuff. If you want to go over like the lymphatic system, the gate, and the non-systems, those are very commonly tested and they're very commonly problematic. I mean, lymphatics is has more of an emphasis in 2018 and going forward, and so be sure that you're spending time on the lymphatics. I have one practice exam that I have as a part of the of the course, but we go over a bunch of practice questions live. So we talk about how to really analyze the question and understand the content that's in it. A bunch of written material. I mean, really, um, I was just on the phone with a guy this morning who said, Will, I I paid 1500 bucks for another course and 500 for yours, and it should have been the reverse. We should have paid 1500 for yours and 500 for that other guy's. So, I mean, it's you're getting a lot of bang for your buck. This is by far by far highest rated on the internet and we're always you know we're always anxious to make sure it's a good fit so you can try it out for a little while i have a 14 day money back guarantee so you try it out for a bit and if you're dissatisfied or you feel like it's not a good fit and that happens sometimes people just don't feel like it's a good fit with their schedule whatever we give you your money back and go spend it on on something that works a little bit better for you so we're we try to be really flexible when it comes to that because i know it's your hard-earned money i'm trying to make it you know as cost effective as possible but let me tell you it's Wait another three months before you take the test. That's a huge opportunity cost when it comes to your PT salary. And it's worth doing right and doing as qu as quickly as possible. So that's why kind of why we are the way we are. All right, so any questions? Let's let's look through the chat box. Any questions you guys may have? Uh, so Anthony, is that the date for both the PTs and the PTAs? So it is the course is geared mostly for PTs. I'll I'll be honest with you. But we accept a lot of PTAs into the class as well because there's so much carryover between the two exams. And every PTA who's ever taken the course comes out saying, now I understand the why behind things. I understood all the questions on the exam at a much deeper level, and I was able to answer them with much more confidence. So I did try earlier this year to, to have a PTA-specific course. I found the enrollment wasn't what I had hoped it would be as far as the scale and so therefore we kind of brought everyone back together in the PT course so that's a long answer to a very short question and Violet I love you too worth every penny in fact Violet last night I was telling my wife about you know Violet's been with us for a while and it's it's so good to see you on the other side of this it's awesome let's see um what other what other questions out there so Marissa and Marissa, yeah, if you were taking the re retaking the exam in October, what do you suggest we start studying again? I really got burnt out before the July exam. So I'm, I'm with you, Marissa. It is a marathon. I, again, it's a, lot like, it's a lot like the Ironman 
um, what do you call it, Ironman races where you, you bike, then you swim, and then someone had this great idea like, hey, let's put a marathon on the end of this. And so just as soon as you feel like you're finished with something, you've got a whole other 26 miles to go, which sounds very, very, very challenging. Uh, so Marissa, as far as avoiding the burnout and where to start, I tell people to take a couple of days off, you know, get your mind off it, go do something fun for a little bit, and then kind of refocus, re-energize with the thought of, you know, why are you going through all this pain and process in the first place? Try to envision yourself on the other end. You know, what's it going to be like when you start getting that paycheck as a PT and you start really making the difference in people's lives on a phys as a physical therapist does? Which is probably why you went into this, this uh, profession in the first place because you really enjoyed it. You really enjoy so many of the aspects of PT. That doesn't mean you have to enjoy the test, but it does help you get through the pain now to get to that, uh, that satisfaction later down the road. So uh, when, do we, when do you suggest start studying again? A couple days. Give yourself a couple days off and um, start working on your weaknesses again. I know it's, I know it's a slog, but, but try to focus in on what is your why. Try to define your why so that you can get through X to get to the Y. <laughs> That's my point. See, Anthony, I can only afford the independent course for now. We still have access to ask you questions. That's a great que question, Anthony. So the short answer is no, and it's mostly just based on the time that it takes for me and the coaches to answer those questions. We build that into the cost of the live course. The independent course has a much reduced price. It's only 99 bucks a month, and that is representative of just perform or completing that independently. Now, that being said, if you have a random question that you're just like, Will, I have looked everywhere and I can't find the answer to this thing, would you please throw me a bone here? I'm always ha happy to answer those questions. But if, but if you like, if, for instance, if you wanted to schedule a Skype chat or have you know, a detailed question chat about you know, some practice questions or giving you grief or whatever, then that would, I'd probably push you to the live course to, to help us get compensated for our time for that. So... That's kind of the logistics of the whole thing. I'm trying to be as honest as possible and straightforward about the whole thing. But that's why I have that independent course at a much reduced price because it's performed independently and you can just go through it at your own pace. Cheryl, yes, I do give discounts for second timers. Send me an email and I can help you out there for sure. I can definitely hook you up. Awesome. Okay. With that, I think, unless there's any other burning questions, I mean, you're always welcome to email me if you have something come up. Always happy to answer your questions. Um, I'll get this recording posted to YouTube and to the, the internet, the Google as fast as I can. Should be up today, uh, so you can come back and watch this as many times as you wish. And yeah, really hope you guys have a fantastic day. Hope this helps in preparing you for your next t next go around. And uh, yeah, just remember you guys are you guys are good at this. I I tell my students that all the time. Remember. You got to this point because you like this and you're good at this. So keep telling yourself that. Give yourself a little Will Crane fist pump to remind yourself that there's a reason why you're in the place you are and so few of the people in this world are eligible to even sit for this test that you are among the elite few. So keep reminding yourself you're good at this and remember that it's not, it's not a competition in the sense that you know, these guys got through and you didn't, so ha, 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 you know, everyone up here is wish, hoping you don't make it through. It's not like that at all. We're all very anxious to get good people into the profession. And so that's what I really love about doing PT final exam is I get to lead people through this gateway and get them through the other side. And then they go and they, they do fantastic things in the physical therapy world. And I think it's, it's very satisfying to see people grow from you know, a one failure, a couple failures on the NPT to coming out on the other side better than ever. And that's just consider this your refining period. You are refining yourself and being awesome. So hang in there, guys. Really appreciate the participation today. I will uh, I'll get this posted as quick as possible and hope you guys have a fantastic day. Let me know if you have any questions and uh, I'll catch you on the flip side. Will Crane fist pumps all around.